Hi, we're the Shaners. And we're observing the moon from Houston, Texas. Hi, I'm Matt and I'm at the South Pole and I'm excited to celebrate the moon. Hi, I'm Matt here at the South Pole Telescope celebrating the moon. Osserviamo la luna. Ciao, sono Maria e osservo la luna dall'osservatorio di Punta Falcone, a Piombino in Italia. Mi piace fotografare la luna con il telescopio per guardare i dettagli della superficie. Un saluto dagli amici dell'Unione Astrofili Italiani. Saremo in tanti a guardare la luna dall'Italia. I'm Matt and I'm here at the South Pole celebrating the moon. Hi, this is Mark. I'm at the South Pole and I'm celebrating the moon. Nosotros somos como la luna. Cada fase es un cambio para llegar a nuestra plenitud. ¡Viva la noche de observación lunar! Hola, I'm Tim and I'm celebrating the moon. Minna de Tsukiyo Mio. I'm focusing on the moon because human will be expanding the area of activity in the near future. I have been supporting it from the aspect of running site analysis using observation data. Let's look at the moon and imagine humans walking there again. Hi, my name is Josh. Um, I work for Ice Cube here at the South Pole and I'm super happy to celebrate the moon this year. Hi, I'm Danielle. I'm here at the South Pole and I'm really excited to celebrate the moon. Hi, I'm Frank Sinkwitz, engineer for the Microobservatory Telescopes, robotic telescopes that you can use to observe the moon. So join me at microobservatory.org. Clear skies. I'm here at the South Pole and I'm super excited to celebrate the moon! Hola, soy Victoriano de la ciudad de Elche, en España. Me gusta observar la luna con prismáticos, telescopios, hablar de ella en podcast y de una forma un poco particular observarla a través de sus meteoritos. Here it is Gianluca Massi from the Virtual Telescope Project. I really love looking at the moon from Rome, Italy, where I live, with our satellites showing together with the beautiful legendary monuments of the Eternal City. And for sure, I will do the same during the International Observe the Moon 9 2021. Hi, I'm Andrea. And I'm Alexandra. And we're observing the moon. planetary geologist at Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. I have a PhD in geology, so I love talking about the moon and the many fascinating geologic features we will be looking at tonight. We are so excited to be here to celebrate International Observe the Moon Night with you. This happens on the fall of each year in September or October. Or you 
can join an event. There are events all over the world today. Want you to be creative, and we are so glad that you're here with us today, tonight, wherever it is. This program was inspired by the interest in large public events we held in 2009 when ASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite arrived at the moon. LRO has continued to support this program, and we also have support from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA headquarters. NASA colleagues across the agency and program supporters, hosts, and observers from all over the world. We have so many things to share with you today. As Andrea said, you are participating in International Observe the Moon Night by watching this broadcast. All right, let's see at our first tweet from social it's tonight. We have Dr. Boz Aldrin who is joining us for Observe the Moon Night tonight. Using the hashtag observe the moon. And here we can see some moon observations from Rome, Italy. Oh my goodness, look at that beautiful landscape and that beautiful moon in the sky. This full moon in the sky. This is wonderful. And next up, we have some awesome images from Japan. And we love our Japanese colleagues. They have done an awesome job helping us explore the moon. And we're so appreciative of all the work at JAXA. And here are some really cool images of some of the spacecraft that Japan has flown as well. Wow, and look at, wow, and look at how many people around the world are participating. So this is from just a little while ago, um, and we can see that more and more people all over the world are joining. So if you are a part of this, you can add yourself to the map as well if you'd like to. Um, and we're really looking forward to see how you're observing the moon again with the hashtag Observe the Moon. And yes, we do like your moon painting. It is so beautiful and creative and a wonderful reminder of how looking at the moon makes all of us feel some awesome emotions and creativity that we can all share with each other. So again, so again, you can find this on moon.nasa.gov slash observe, and um, we are going to keep track of how you're observing the moon throughout this broadcast. Uh, so keep letting us know, keep sharing your stories, and um, you can also send us those moon questions. We have a team of lunar experts standing by to answer your questions on social media, and Alexander will answer some of them during the broadcast. So. So to our, when you go to our website as well, you can also find um, our moon maps. So each day, sorry, each year we make moon maps for this particular day. Um, and you can find them um, on moon.nasa.gov under our resources. These are moon maps that Brian Day and Jen Baer from NASA Ames make each year for the phase that the moon is in right now. And this year, Brian also made some incredible flyovers of the different maps as well from the highlighted sites. 
And we are going to share a few of those with you here today. And let's start with one from Sinus Rhythm. Sinus Aridum, the Bay of Rainbows, is a bay along the northwest edge of Mare Imbrium. This 260 kilometer wide crater's floor was flooded with lava along with the Imbrium Basin. Its north and west rim forms the Jura Mountains. Now for a special guest, we're back. Thank you so much. Now for a special guest, John Bovere is joining us to give us an extraordinary view of the moon. John, how's it going? It's going really well. Thank you so much, Dr. Matija Novak and Andrea. All right, we are going to be joining John in just a few minutes. We're having some technical difficulties here. Sorry about that. But John is from SLU and he's going to be showing us views from around the world from telescopes um, that he works with uh, in Chile and in other places as well. So it's going to be really, really neat to see what the moon looks like at this moment from different parts of the world. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea and Dr. Matija Novak. And greetings. Are you as excited as I am to observe the moon together, all as one global community? Well, I'm over the moon. Well, not literally. My name is Dr. John H. Bovere, and I'm the director of curriculum at SLU, a community of students, educators, and astronomers sharing their knowledge and discoveries of the universe using an arsenal of powerful robotic telescopes at premier observatories in both hemispheres. SLU provides a direct means for students to connect with the universe and fosters a collaborative citizen science for the next generation. There are learning activities called quests to embark on and discover the secrets behind some of the universe's biggest mysteries while capturing images with SLU's suite of telescopes, such as the Canary One half meter telescope that we're looking through right now. I'm speaking to you all from Las Vegas, Nevada. But tonight, you are celebrating the, this year's International Observe the Moon Night with live views of the waxing gibbous moon from SLU's flagship observatory at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, located on the island of Tenerife on the northwestern coast of Africa. And later on, we'll check out the moon from our southern hemisphere observatory in La Dehisa, Chile, in association with the Catholic University of Chile. We're looking through Canary One uh, Half Meter Telescope, which is my favorite one for capturing the moon. Now, it's still too bright in Chile at this very moment, so we'll check out the moon with our Chilean telescopes later on in the hour. But before we go, I want, to, uh, I want us to peek through one more telescope. Um, this, is the, this is SLU's Canary Four Solar System Telescope. This telescope lets us zoom in on the lunar surface and see it in exquisite detail. Wow, what a gorgeous moon. We hope you enjoy the lunar views throughout the evening. Oh, I wanna give a shout out to anybody who knows a teacher or educator or knows a parent of a child who is at school, basically anybody in education. If you know anybody in education or related to someone who knows somebody in education, please hop on over to slu.org. SLU.org has free student accounts for classrooms in light polluted areas ready and waiting to connect your students with the stars. This grant aims to help 1 million students nationwide experience the wonder of space from their classrooms and home computers. Now it's a very ambitious goal, but you know the same. If you shoot for the moon and miss, you'll land among the stars. You can learn more about the space exploration grant at SLU.org. 
What's more is you can come and get free professional development to learn how to use the platform in your classes and sections. Now it's time for our second social media check-in. So back to you, Dr. Matija Novak and Andrea. Thank you so much, John. Now let's check in with how you are observing the moon. Let us know by sharing your pictures and sending us your questions using the hashtag observe the moon on whatever social media platform you like to use. Let's look at some ways people are observing the moon around the world right now. Miremos la luna. Oh, this is beautiful from Brazil. Oh my goodness, I love how the sky looks with the, the leaves and the moonlight, just beautiful. And this is a beautiful picture of a view from the moon from Italy. Thank you so much, Paolo, for sending us this picture. We love all the different perspectives and ways that we can view our beautiful moon. Oh, I love having a little trouble seeing this one, but I'm thinking that we're seeing, oh, a, a daughter and um, someone else observing the moon in a light polluted sky. That's incredible. That's one of the reasons I love observing the moon so much is that you can see it even in some really bright cities as well as those beautiful dark skies far away from the city. So I'm so glad so many of you are joining us. This is great. And of course, a shout out to our planetariums. We have joining us the South Carolina State Museum virtual planetarium sky tours. So beautiful image of the moon. Thank you so much to planetariums for keeping excitement about the moon alive. And now we're gonna check out another place on the moon uh, with Brian Day from NASA Ames. Copernicus is a magnificent 93 kilometer diameter crater with terraced walls, a flat floor, and a group of central peaks towering 1,200 meters above the floor. The crater is over 3,700 meters deep. Love that activity. And we are in the midst of a very exciting time for lunar science and exploration. We have an orbiter at the moon right now that is helping us better understand the moon's surface and its environment. We're sending new instruments to the moon with commercial partners, and we are preparing to return to the moon with people through our Artemis program. Let's learn more about why we're going back to the moon and what we're doing to prepare. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, 
and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our own planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the lunar south pole to establish the Artemis base camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect descending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds. Starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The Eagle has landed. We got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. And what we will accomplish there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach. As we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission, and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step. The Moon's South Pole is a fascinating region to study, especially when you pay attention to the areas that are in sunlight and darkness over time. And thanks to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we can zoom in for an extremely close view of the terrain that shows how the sun shines on the South Pole. Here, we see how the moon's topography creates areas of shadows over the course of two lunar days, which is equal to two months on Earth. The flowing dance of sunlight and shadow on the surface reveals areas that exist in permanent darkness, nearly persistent sunshine, and others where the balance of light and dark fluctuates through time. Studying the shadows at the South Pole informs scientists about the temperature at and below the surface, and the possibilities regarding water and other volatiles. 
all of which sheds light on what future lunar exploration will entail. I'm Ernie Wright. I work in the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. We're looking at a computer model of the view at the south pole of the moon. This is like a time lapse to show the motion of the sun and the earth and how the shadows change over time. Things don't rise and set in the usual way here. The sun travels around the horizon, never getting more than a degree and a half above or below it, so there are always these long shadows. And from here, the Earth appears to be upside down and rotating backwards, but that's just because of our point of view. The Earth doesn't move much in the moon's sky. It's always in roughly the same place, just sort of bobbing around. That's true everywhere on the near side of the moon. It's a consequence of the moon always pointing the same face toward Earth. It takes about a month for the sun to make a complete circuit around the horizon, and every so often it'll pass behind the Earth, creating an eclipse. I've slowed down time here a little so that it's easier to see. On Earth, that would be a total lunar eclipse, uh, the moon passing through the shadow cast by the Earth. But if you're standing on the moon, it's an eclipse of the sun. The terrain at the South Pole is especially rugged. The rim of Shackleton craters in the foreground here, and the mountain off on the horizon, unofficially known as Mons Malapert, it's about 85 miles away. Shackleton Crater is about 13 miles wide. Not quite as wide as the Grand Canyon, but it's twice as deep. The sunlight never reaches the crater floor, so temperatures there are around 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. This model of the terrain is made possible by Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been mapping the surface of the moon from lunar orbit since 2009. LRO's maps will be incredibly important for exploring the moon and locating water and other resources there. Watching Apollo footage of astronauts doing geology on the surface of the moon is a really great way to think about preparing for Artemis, for putting people on the lunar surface once again. We learn a lot in how they did science operations on the moon and what it's like to work on the moon. You see them doing geology. You see them taking rock samples, putting in a drive tube to take a core sample. You see them bouncing along the surface of the moon on the lunar rover that they used in Apollo 15 through 17. So it's a great way to help drive technology development for the next generation of spacesuits and geology sampling tools. There's these facilities that help us train like we are on the lunar surface. You know, these 1-6G offload systems or putting people in the aquatic environment are great ways to train the mobility part, right? Like what can you do and how different does it feel to be in 1-6G and do these tasks? We've been training astronauts in geology and geoscience for decades now. The Apollo astronauts had literally hundreds of hours of training in geology before they flew to the moon. It's often said that the Apollo astronauts had the equivalent of a master's degree in geology by the time they flew to the moon. In the intervening decades since Apollo, we've been training astronauts who fly to the International Space Station because when they're on the ISS, they spend time observing the Earth looking out the window, taking pictures of what they see on the Earth's surface. Now that we're looking at putting astronauts on the surface of the moon, we also take them into the field. We take them to field sites here on Earth that resemble field sites that we expect them to see on the moon. That's the reason why we take them out into places that are unique, like volcanic landscapes or places that are analogous to the lunar surface to train them on the scale and fidelity of science that you just can't recreate in these facilities. And so by combining this classroom and field training, we're able to prep them for fundamentals of geology, the major driving lunar science questions that we have that we hope to address with the Artemis program and teaching them how to do field work in relevant analog environments. For just science aspects of developing new spacesuits, can it get you to where you need to go and then once you get there can you do the cool science that you need to do and so that's can you move effectively and efficiently in the suit to be able to collect the samples or use the tools or the instruments for the visibility it's like can you make the necessary observations that you need to or does the suit have the lights on it that it needs to to illuminate the surface and make the observations you need to 
The Lunar South Pole holds tremendous resources that are going to allow us to, to continue to explore. This is, this is a place that we've never been before. There's so much to be learned from getting boots on the ground and exploring a unique place that challenges us as humans and also helps us develop technologies that make our everyday life that much better. We think there might be volatiles present at the South Pole. By using these volatiles, we'll be able to do things like create drinking water, create rocket fuel to launch astronauts back to Earth. And so by harnessing the power of the land, we'll be able to help astronauts establish that long-term sustainable presence. It's human nature to explore. Pushing our boundaries and exploring our universe is, I think, just one of those things that's just stuck in our human nature and that we need to do it in order to understand the world around us, including our Earth and our solar system. Wow, that was so exciting and inspiring. Now the views tonight of tonight's moon through SLU's Canary 4 Solar System Telescope are pretty fantastic. There is one spot that I love to point out to myself whenever I'm looking at our natural satellite, both through a telescope or with the naked eye, and it's where the first crewed mission landed. Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin explored the lunar surface near the southwest corner of Mare Tranquillitatis during Apollo 11. An easy way to spot it out is to look for the crater Multike. Uh, it's this one right here. And a little bit away from this left highland tip here is about where Apollo 11 landed. Now it's time for another social media check-in. Thanks, John. That was awesome. Now let's check in with you and your moon observations. Don't forget to use the hashtag observe the moon. Well, it looks like we have a planetarium that's sharing uh, information about the moon tonight. So fantastic. Thank you so much for, for getting out there and, and sharing the moon in your community. And more beautiful artwork showing the awesome things that we see in our sky, including the moon. And that looks like it might be the sun, the relationship between the moon and the sun. Thank you so much um, for sending us your beautiful artwork. Wow, this one's beautiful as well. I feel like I could just hang that right up on my wall. Oh my goodness, what a view. Thank you. <laughs> wow, beautiful pictures showing all the different ways that we see the moon up in our sky. Sometimes it's on a clear night. Sometimes it has some clouds in front of it to give it a little extra um, spookiness, maybe some people would say. So thank you so much for all these beautiful pictures about of the moon. We love looking at them. Yeah, viewing the moon is my favorite too. So this is this is so great. Oh, and this is a great picture to demonstrate. We really like to start with the moon and then keep exploring, launch from the moon into, you know, whatever part of the sky that you want to also view. So this is great. We have Saturn and Jupiter and the moon all in one. Incredible. Thank you so much, Rupesh. <laughs> And now we're going to take another look at the moon uh, in our moon trek tours. Let's take a look. Most impact craters on the moon are quite circular in shape. Schiller is an exception. It takes the form of a strongly elongated oval measuring 180 by 70 kilometers. It was likely formed by the impact of an asteroid coming in at a very shallow angle and striking the ground nearly horizontally. On International Observe the Moon Night 2021, we'll see the Harbinger Mountains just after they have experienced sunrise. This small range measures about 95 kilometers long and reaches heights of about 2 kilometers. Larger telescopes show volcanic vents and channels on the range's western edge. Most impact craters on the moon are quite circular in shape. Schiller is an exception. It takes the form of a strongly elongated oval measuring 180 by 70 kilometers. 
It was likely formed by the impact of an asteroid coming in at a very shallow angle and striking the ground nearly horizontally. Wonderful. What a beautiful view. So International Observe the Moonlight is certainly a time for science, but it's also a time to honor our personal and cultural connections to the moon. The moon is woven into our language and into cultures around the world. We're going to show you one example here today, and we hope that you try to learn more about the moon in your own culture and other cultures around the world as well. La luna International es importante para todo el mundo, y lo ha sido por we'll mucho tiempo. The, the moon has been important to people all over the world for a long sunrise. time. Let's now this listen to a beautiful Incan story about the moon. Hello, Dr. John Bobert from SLU again. Next, an educator and SLU ambassador, Milton Villarroyal, will share an Inca myth about our moon titled Las Lagrimas de Plata de la Luna Inca, or in English, The Silver Teardrops of the Inca Moon. Enjoy! Las Lagrimas de Plata de la Luna Inca Uno de los muchos mitos que rodean a nuestra luna afirma que se creía que estaba compuesta de plata pura. A los ojos de los incas, mamaquilla, o luna, estaba compuesta enteramente del precioso metal. La luna tenía el color de la plata, y su parecido a este caro metal dio origen a esta historia. En la capital del imperio inca, el Cusco, los incas tenían un templo dedicado exclusivamente a la luna, y dentro de él existía una máscara redonda de la luna hecha completamente de plata. El templo era cuidado enteramente por sacerdotisas que estaban completamente dedicadas al culto de esta divinidad, porque la luna era considerada la guardiana de todas las mujeres. Las fases lunares eran el horno en el cual se fundía la plata. La luna nueva representaba el horno vacío que se iría llenando con cada día que pasaba. De esta manera, la luna se convertía en una nueva fuente de plata acumulada gota a gota. Después de esto, Mamaquilla comenzaba a derramar su preciosa carga mientras la luna menguaba de a poco cada día. Se creía que esta plata se derramaba dentro de las montañas. Una de esas montañas fue el Cerro Rico de Potosí, Bolivia, donde se encontró plata a flor de suelo y sostuvo la economía del Reino de España por varios siglos pero no todo tenía un final feliz. También se creía que la luna lloraba lágrimas de plata. Los incas creían que toda la plata que se encontraba en la tierra procedía de las lágrimas de la luna. Mamaquilla lloraba cuando se cometían injusticias en contra de su gente y especialmente en contra de las mujeres. El pillaje de los conquistadores y la forma abusiva con la cual se trataba a su gente hacían que Mamaquilla llorara aún más plata. Hace mucho tiempo, los incas utilizaron esta plata para elaborar bella joyería y orfebrería y lujosa decoración palaciega. Después de la conquista, la plata de las lágrimas de Mamaquilla también decoró los palacios de los victoriosos españoles. El mito también asegura que en una fecha no muy lejana se encontrará un nuevo depósito de plata, lleno de lágrimas de la silenciosa viajera de la noche. Wow, thank you so much, Milton. Educators, slu.org has free student accounts for classrooms and light polluted areas to connect your students with the stars, ready and waiting for you.
my eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me that I call my own. Through the dark, through the door, through where no one's been before, but it feels like home. They can say, they can say it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say I've lost my mind. Gonna make however big, however small. Let me be a part of it all. Share your dreams with me. You may be right, you may be wrong, but say that you'll bring me along to the world you see, to the one I close my eyes to see. Brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me Gassendi is a 110 Hello, kilometer oh, diameter. More fractured plate not, that lies on the northern rim of Mare Humor. It had its floor pushed up by magma rising from below. Larger telescopes will reveal a network of fractures across the crater floor. It's amazing to experience the same moon from a different vantage points. Have you gone outside yet to catch the moon with your own eyes? Make sure you do that tonight to add a third vantage point to your celebration of the uh, International Observe the Moon Night 2021. Thank you so much for enjoying the live views of our nearest celestial neighbor through SLU's telescopes. Oh, thank you so much, John. It is really wonderful to explore the moon with you and around the world with you. And now we're gonna turn it over to you all out there. We've been getting some great questions from you. Again, you can still send them in uh, using the hashtag observe the moon. We're gonna answer some on air and there are people waiting online to answer your questions as well. So let's see, Alexandra, let's get started. Yeah. So, Rolando on Twitter would like to know, um, he says, my son, nine years old, wants to know what's at the center of our moon. Well, that's a fantastic question. And actually what's at the center of our moon is very similar to what's at the center of our earth. And that's an iron core. So structurally, the moon is very similar to the earth. It has an iron core and it has a somewhat warm middle, mantle middle, and then it's got a cold crust. And um, now it's, it's a lot smaller than the earth. So the, the structure, the thicknesses of these materials are a little bit different, but it's very similar and it does have an iron core much like the earth. 
Excellent. Okay. Now, Stella on Twitter would like to know, why are some craters circle-shaped and others are oval-shaped? Fantastic question. Well, the simple answer for that is that the more circle-shaped craters are resulting from impacts that came in more at a, a straight-on angle to the surface, whereas the ones, the craters that are more elongated are from impactors that came in at a more oblique angle, so at a more slanted angle to the surface of the moon. And so the difference in those types of shapes actually tells us a lot of information about how that surface was impacted by whatever material impacted it. Excellent, and I guess a related question here, the Nordford family on Facebook would like to know, how many craters are there on the moon? Oh, wow, well, that's a great question, and there really are more than we can count. There's just craters all over the surface of the moon. Some areas have more craters than others. Usually the older areas have a lot more craters than younger areas, but there are just, a lot of craters, thousands of craters all over the moon. So I don't know that anyone's actually counted, but there are a lot. Excellent. Well, a lot of people have a lot of questions about the moon. Now we're going to hear some more answers from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter project scientist, Noah Petro, answering, what the heck is that? Hi everyone, I'm Noah Petro, the project scientist of NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, which has been at the moon for over a decade now, sending back a treasure trove of data, including some spectacular images. Take a look at that. Inevitably, whenever NASA publishes a photo or releases a video of ours showing the lunar landscape, we get emails, tweets, and online posts from viewers asking us to further explain some of the weird looking visuals that they're seeing. So today, we're going to look at these strange and mysterious looking features on the moon to answer the question, what the heck is that? So let's launch into this. The moon. In our video, Apollo 13 Views of the Moon, many viewers wondered about this strange looking circle with dark lines. So what the heck is that? Well, for starters, this is not the remnants of an ancient lake. And apologies to the sci-fi crowd, it's not a secret moon base with runways or spacecraft. This is a geological feature known as Kamarov Crater. It's 80 kilometers wide, and it's on the far side of the moon, on the edge of Mare Moscoviense. The floor is covered with a network of rills that make it look like sun-dried mud, and it's a great example of a floor fracture crater, or FFC. So what made Komarov look like that? The leading idea among scientists is that FFCs are like volcanoes that didn't quite reach the surface. An impactor hits the moon, forming the crater, and underneath the crater floor, the impact creates a zone of broken rock called a breccia lens. Magma from deeper inside the moon rises into the cracks of the breccia lens, but something stops it from getting all the way to the surface. So it spreads out under the crater floor, forming what's called a sill. The magma and hot gases in the sill push on the crater floor from below, causing it to bulge and fracture like the top of a cake in an oven. The cracks you see are known as graben. Release the graben! Using data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, scientists have cataloged over 100 floor fractured craters, just like Kamarov. They are fascinating works of nature from billions of years ago. Billions. An image from the Apollo 11 mission has gotten a lot of attention over the years. Here you see a pair of craters known as Messier and Messier A. But they don't look like the more typical round craters that you see on the moon. Elro has taken even more high definition shots of these two sites, showing us incredible detail. These oval shapes and areas of ejected rock do look like they could belong in Star Wars as the crash site of the Millennium Falcon. Yay. And actually, the way you might imagine a scene like that happening, with an object slamming and then skipping across the surface, is what took place here, except with an asteroid. You see, at very low angles, an incoming asteroid can actually become decapitated, with the top part splitting off at the impact and either escaping back into space or skipping to form a second crater. Think of it like skipping a stone across the water. Both laboratory impact experiments and computer modeling have demonstrating the physical effects of the oblique impact of a large asteroid on the moon. And LRO's data helps prove the formation of these unusual features. LRO. Scattered across the lunar surface are these long winding features, which many viewers have correctly assumed are channels. On the moon, these are called rills. There's a prominent one here on the Aristarchus Plateau. And if you're comparing the visuals on the Earth, you might be tempted to think about long river canyons flowing in long sweeping meanders, like the mighty Mississippi pouring out into the Gulf of Mexico. And if that's what you're thinking, erase it from your memory, because it's wrong. 
Now, to be fair, when these channels were observed on the moon for the first time, there was an immediate thought that water may have carved these features. But once we got actual samples from the moon, combined with additional spacecraft data and studies over the years, we've come to understand that there was never flowing water on the moon. So what could carve these sweeping features? If you said flowing liquid hot magma after it erupted on the moon's surface, you'd be correct. Winner. When lava flows across the surface, it erodes the crust and slowly flows as it bends and turns, forming these beautiful channels. We have a great view of this in our Rima Prins visualization. Here you see a long channel where lava once flowed from the Vera of volcanic depression. Eruptions of lava fountains formed a lake of lava 300 meters deep and carved a lava channel 100 times deeper than anything found on the Earth. These types of features were so compelling that the Apollo 15 mission went and explored one in 1971, known as the Hadley Rill. Future explorers may want to visit others, but they should leave their fishing lines at home. This visual is one of our most popular. This is a picture of Tycho Crater and the famous Central Peak Boulder, which is about 400 feet wide. Now that's longer than a football field. Whee! How in the world did that wind up there? Well, I have no idea. No. We're going to fly now into a spot on the near side to look at this weird feature, which has long defied an easy explanation. It's known as Reiner Gamma. Those squiggles and swirls sure are bizarre. A combination of computer modeling and data gathered from numerous recent lunar missions, including Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, now sheds light on the origin of these unusual surface decorations, which we call lunar swirls. Now think of it this way. You've probably been told that when you go outside to put on your sunscreen. Well, these beautiful swirls are constant reminders that the moon is no different from you and me, except that it's a moon and we're humans. These swirls are examples of what happens when the moon applies SPF 3 million. The moon is constantly bombarded by radiation from the sun and galaxy, as well as micrometeorites that sandblast the surface. These swirls, however, show what happens when the radiation is blocked from reaching the surface. Uh, data suggests that small magnetic anomalies block radiation from reaching the surface and therefore prevent the moon from getting sunburned in these areas, which keep them as bright as they appear to be. So the next time you put on sunblock to go lounge outside, think of the moon and how it gets baked in the sun, just like you and me. <coughs> Thanks for watching today. Hopefully this video taught you more about the moon and that you aren't left thinking, what the heck was that? I'm Noah Petro, signing off. Gassendi is a 110 kilometer diameter floor fractured crater that lies on the northern rim of Mare Humorum. It had its floor pushed up by magma rising from below. Larger telescopes will reveal a network of fractures across the crater floor. The future of human space exploration is being driven by what we can discover and accomplish on the moon. And with NASA's confirmation of ice existing at the lunar south pole, the critical task of finding and mapping where water exists, what form it is in, and where it came from can now begin. Leading us on that journey will be NASA's first mobile robotic mission on the moon, known as Viper, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. It will be delivered to the Nobile region of the South Pole as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. This region sits just outside the western rim of Nobile Crater and covers an area of 36 square miles. As the first ever resource mapping mission on the surface of another celestial body, Viper will roam the surface equipped with three science instruments and a drill to detect and analyze various lunar soil environments at a range of depths and temperatures. The rover will venture into permanently shadowed craters, some of the coldest spots in the solar system, where ice reserves have been preserved for billions of years. NASA had four critical parameters when choosing a landing site for Viper. Available sunlight, Earth visibility for communications from the moon to the Earth, data showing the potential presence of water and other resources, and terrain that is well suited for Viper to navigate. The area to the west of Nobile Crater met these conditions. Once on the surface, Viper's mission will last 100 days and cover between 10 to 15 miles. 
and while a baseline traverse route through the Nobile region has been identified for the rover, the scientific discoveries Viper makes along the way will actually influence where the mission team sends it next, so its planned route will most likely change. During its travels, Viper will visit at least six locations where data suggests ice could be found. By helping determine the locations of where water and other resources exist, Viper's findings will help pave the way for future landing sites under NASA's Artemis program. The prospects of achieving a long-term human presence on our moon never look so bright. Hello again. Now, earlier in the broadcast, we were looking at the moons from the Canary Islands, but now we've traveled more than 5,500 miles or 8,900 kilometers from the Canary Islands to La Dehisa, Chile. Check out the moon with SLU's Chile 1 Wide Field Telescope. It's amazing to experience the same moon from different vantage points. Have you gone outside yet to catch the moon in your own eyes? Make sure you do that tonight to add a third vantage point to your, our celebration of the International Observe the Moon Night 2021. Thank you so much for, live, for enjoying the live views of our nearest celestial neighbor through SLU's telescopes. Now let's take one more look at your moon observations. Andrea, what do we have? Oh, we have this great view of the moon from Houston, Texas. It looks like maybe a painting. I love this moon art. Thank you. And next we have some a beautiful artist painting showing all the different colors of the moon in different compositions. So thank you so much again. We love seeing this creativity around science and around the moon. Oh, and we have moon observations in Pakistan. It's just incredible that people around the world right now are observing the moon. And we've been seeing so many more of your moon views and your moon observations coming in. So follow along and see what everyone else is, is doing around the world right now on that hashtag observe the moon. It's great to, to see what you're doing. Thank you. All right. So I think we're wrapping up here. <laughs> This has been such a pleasure. I hope those of you who are able to do so go out and look at the moon tonight from wherever you are, knowing that people around the world are observing with you. And keep letting us know, keep letting each other know how you are participating, again, using that hashtag observe the moon. And you can still add yourself to the map of lunar observers around the world. And you can share your feedback with us about this broadcast and about International Observe the Moon Night so we can keep making the program better year after year on our website, which is moon.nasa.gov slash observe. And we also want to take a minute to congratulate another team. There's another great planetary event today. The Lucy mission launched successfully this morning, and it is now off to explore the Trojan asteroids. It's going to help us better understand our solar system origins. So we hope you follow along with that mission. We hope that you continue observing the moon, the skies, the stars, and the world around you. And we're really, really happy that you were able to be here with us tonight. Thanks so much for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your International Observe the Moon night. Adios! Goodbye.
Hey everybody, this is Beck, and I'm a maker of music. And like the great Sun Ra said, space is the place. And I'm Farah, I work at NASA, and I use AI to explore Mars. And I brought a few friends along who know something about artificial intelligence. Hi, I'm John. Hi, I'm Isabel. 